So let's begin by adopting a stable, comfortable, upright position, serviceable for meditation. So we think about keeping our feet flat and our back straight, torso open, hands in the lap right over left with the palms upturned and the thumbs gently touching. Our eyes are gently closed or slightly open, making sure we let in enough light to remain alert. And try to maintain an awareness of not slouching, not leaning. But we also let go of any unnecessary tension or rigidity in the body relaxing into a stable, comfortable, upright position. And then begin to let go of attending to the external world. allowing sights and sounds to be as they are without investigation. Constraining your awareness just of the body and mind. Concentrating that awareness in the present by attending closely to the physical sensation of the air moving into and back out of the tip of the nostrils. Noticing quickly when anything other than that one physical sensation is arising in the mind and without judgment or frustration, lifting our awareness up from those distractions and placing it gently but firmly again and again on the breath.
then when the mind is more calm and generate a broad altruistic motivation for our time, taking a moment to intentionally widen our circle of concern, trying to embrace countless sentient beings in that field of love and compassion. And thinking that by using this time to become more and more familiar with constructive states of mind and to reduce the influence of states of mind that are not beneficial or constructive, then we engage in a process of genuine inner transformation that is the way in which we are able to be of greater and greater benefit to sentient beings. And I think that's the purpose of our time. And then with that motivation, we will begin contemplating what are known as the six factors that stimulate the arising of those not so beneficial or constructive states of mind so that we can become mindful of those influences and the impact that they have in daily life. So the first of these factors are the mental predispositions that we have toward these negative states of mind. So for example, at the moment, we may not be experiencing jealousy or ill will or greed or envy, maliciousness. But at the moment that a person says or does something unkind, where we come across an object that strongly sparks desirous attachment, then because the predisposition is there in the mind from past habituation, then very quickly, very easily, the mind can move into these negative states. The seed of the negative states is present in the mind at all times, waiting to contact the right circumstances. So think in your own life. bringing to mind examples of just how quickly, how effortlessly these negative 
states of mind can arise, how we can go from a state of relative peace and ease into experiencing these negative states based on your own experiences. And thinking in this way, we should be reminded of the importance of vigilance. Of guarding the three doors of body, speech, and mind. And of applying antidotes the moment that our mind does slip into these afflicted states. So again, using those same examples of when the mind, due to predisposition, very easily and quickly give rise to afflicted states, think of one or two things that you could do to try to quickly put an end to those states. And if you're not sure of anything that could be effective, then try to develop a real interest in investigating what would be effective.
And the second factor is contact with the object. An object is an object of knowledge. It could be anything outside of oneself, people, places, situations, even ideas. And these objects of knowledge fall into two categories, objects of attachment and objects of aversion. When an object seems to have pleasant, attractive qualities or aspects, we relate to it as an object of attachment. Feeling as though our happiness is dependent on continued uninterrupted contact with the object. When the object seems to have unpleasant qualities, characteristics, an aversion arises and we feel like our happiness is dependent on successfully separating ourselves from contact with the object. So think in your own life what, for you, often serve as objects of attachment and objects of aversion. What do you find yourself pulling into your life and pushing away?
and realizing how that aversion or attachment arises together with, simultaneous with the object, contacting the object. Again, due to the predispositions in the mind for attachment and aversion. Think about these objects and the influence in your own life and contemplate whether there may be some objects that are sparking the strongest levels of attachment or aversion and contemplate if until the mind is stronger, more tamed, more trained, whether we may need to keep some respectful distance from some of these objects and whether that would be beneficial to reduce the frequency or the duration of being in contact with some of these objects. There may be other objects that are less intense in terms of the amount of aversion or attachment that they trigger. And we may be able, we may be prepared to integrate those more immediately by seeing them in a more realistic and holistic way, recognizing that no object is entirely attractive, beneficial, and no object is entirely negative. So I think now of ways of relating on a day-to-day -day basis, 
in that more realistic way. Then when you are ready, we'll come back together. And we'll dedicate. So recollect your altruistic motivation. And think that by having engaged in this contemplation, you've actualized that motivation, which has generated positive energy in the mind, and I think that you freely offer the fruit of your practice, that positive energy for the benefit of all sentient beings, without exception. Making when that positive energy ripens, may it serve as a cause and condition to eliminate war and conflict, poverty, famine, disease, disasters, all painful inner and outer conditions. May it fully ripen the minds of all sentient beings. May they quickly meet perfect teachers and arise in a state of full enlightenment. May I too achieve this state of enlightenment in order to work for the benefit of sentient beings perfectly. May any obstacles facing the Guru's long life be completely dispelled. And may I and all sentient beings in this moment come under the joyful care and guidance of enlightened beings. May we be guided and protected until we swiftly achieve that state of enlightenment. Thank you.